Hello everyone, welcome back to Mind Pump. In the first half of the show, we talk about the formula for a winning mindset, for fat loss, for muscle building, and a lot more. In the second half of the show, we answer four questions from our Mind Pump Media Instagram account. Questions such as, are overhead farmer's walks worth adding to my workout? What's the value of using smelling salts? What's the best midnight snack? And why is rest between sets important? Finally, are you a busy person and sometimes just don't have time to watch a full episode of Mind Pump? Well, we have the answer for you. It's called Mind Pump Clips right here on YouTube. Go over there and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. The winning mindset when it comes to fat loss, muscle building, and fitness in general can be summed up in the following. Focus on what you can control and accept what you can't. Ignore the things you can't control and focus on all the other stuff. I feel like that's advice for even for like control. financial health. That's advice for life. Like everything. Yeah. That's yeah. life. I mean, you yeah. can apply control it in so many directions. But it's so important in fitness, right? Yeah. It's so important in fitness. It's like... Uh, what inspired that tip? What's, what's your thought? Bro? It's uh, What inspired that? Yeah. Um, God, let me think else. what inspired he had, that. He had nothing else. No, you know what it was? <laughs> no, actually, you know what it was? <laughs> I, know what, I know what inspired it. Uh, I saw a post. I sent it to you guys yesterday. <clears throat> Uh, someone did this post of like Brock Lesnar when he was a kid and like grown up. Okay. And there was a picture of him when he was 16 years old. He's yeah. an absolute beast. 16. He looks like a pro bodybuilder when he's 16 years old. Yeah. Just crazy genetics, right? Crazy muscle building genetics. And I remember when I was 16, there was a period of time there where I was like really like, <clears throat> it's like pissed me off that why, you know, I don't have these crazy muscle building. I got over it real quick because if I didn't, I would have stopped working out. So that's what made me think about it. It's like, yeah, you know, I've been working out forever. Always wanted to build muscle, all that stuff. I don't have, you know, I don't have superior crazy muscle building genes. I have skinny guy genes or whatever. But uh, I got over, it, accepted it, and just moved on. And if I didn't do that, I think uh, I don't think I would have been able to continue to pursue fitness. I really wouldn't have. So that that's what that's what kind of brought that up. But I think it's so important because you know you guys know this when you get a client. <clears throat> Clients that come with to you with that winning attitude, they almost always do great. And then clients that come to you with that, the opposite attitude, it, you have to change that before you can ever really make any long term progress. Well, I, I like that too because um, how many times did you guys get clients that would come in with like a picture too of somebody yeah. that mm -hmm. they wanted to look like, and they're like, you look at them right away, and you're like, oh shit, well, here we go. <laughs> Yeah, you, we could do a you lot. Look, Here's the comparison. You trap. look nothing like this person. You know what I'm saying? You want to know what I said to Six a inch height difference, you know, waist to hip ratios away different. Like just not happening. Or they like just take like uh, their arms and then they like, it's like this Frankenstein approach of like, I want this and then I want her yeah. butt. I want this person's butt, yeah. this person's shoulders, this person's I'm like, okay, actually, I'll just get in the lab. I actually made a joke once to a potential client and I read him so I, I knew he would laugh, but this dude comes in. And uh, he's an engineer and he's like, I want to look like, and I remember what he showed, he showed me his picture of like this, like look like a physique competitor, right? It's a Jack guy or whatever. I said, look, I know you were referred to me by your friend who said, I'm really good. I am really good, but I'm not Jesus. I can't perform <laughs> <laughs> miracles. <laughs> and he started laughing. It was a, it was a great start to our, you know, our fitness relationship. Jim Jesus. Yeah. But this is super important because there are definitely things you can't change. For example, um, Maybe you have a lifestyle that doesn't allow you because you have other priorities, right? That doesn't allow you to work out uh, for an hour, five days a week. Or maybe you have a new baby and you just can't get optimal sleep all the time. Or maybe you are you live in a household where you have to eat a particular way. Or maybe you do have, you know, genetics that aren't, you know, optimal for fat loss or muscle building. Or you're comparing yourself to other people like... When you focus on those uncontrollables, those things that you really have no influence over, you are making yourself disempowered. You're literally living in this kind of victim, disempowered state of mind. And that just is that will make this impossible. You're yeah. never going to be able it doesn't to doesn't move this. you forward at all. Not only does it not make move you forward, but it makes it a very negative, crappy existence. And eventually you'll quit because you won't want to be in the space anymore where everything sucks. So this is a very well, important uh, state of mind to get into if you want long term success. If you're, you can always find deficiencies. You can always find something that you can focus on that uh, is a negative or it's something that's like, you know, well, it can talk you immediately out of pursuing a goal like fitness. Like you can, you can uh, look at uh, past history of health and genetics and you can look at, uh, 
you know, body types and whatnot in your family. And you can look at your friends and their experience when they went through this. And then, you know, you can latch yourself onto their experiences. It's just like, it's endless what you can do. Uh, if you really start like going down that, that rabbit hole. Yeah. So now why, be honest, bother? be honest. How often do you guys have to have this, this conversation with yourself? Oh, are you kidding mm -hmm. me? This is like being a human. It's constant. <laughs> You always have especially to, especially the comparison thing, right? That's like one, especially because it's so um, everywhere right now. Social media, like in, internet in general, you can always find you know some example out there where you're like, wow, they, you know, I could see, I could see myself kind of looking like that, or like I like what they're doing, and and you just sort of kind of get drawn into that. Uh, for me, easily. even more than that, not so much in fitness anymore, but just in everyday life, like okay, I can't uh, work out in my garage. It wakes up the baby. Okay, I got to accept that. Oh, the economy's not great right now. So these things I wanted to do, I can't do anymore. So, okay, I got to accept that. Uh, the weather, um, you know, your your kids are in a particular mood or, you know, my, my son's going to be going off to college. That's going to be tough or whatever. Yeah. Like all these different things. Like this happens every day, I think. it's just a, But you have to have that, that mindset where you look at something and say, do I have influence over this? Or do I have no influence over this in reality? And maybe I should just stop focusing on it. It's a stoic philosophy. It's a, and it's a, it's one that's, again, it's a way, if you ask anybody who's successful, I think they'll echo something that sounds very similar to this. Yeah. I think the idea, or at least for me, the, the practice is to look at everything as it, as it happens for you and not to you, mm -hmm. right. In life, like just everything, <clears throat> everything is an opportunity for something good to come out that's of just that. a mind sh that's a mindset shift that's all that is right because uh, right. whether it's true or not doesn't matter right right i mean 100 percent. i mean it's it, and and no matter what uh hard times are going to come no matter what challenges are going to happen no matter what um you're going to fall sh there's always going to be somebody who does something better than you looks better than you makes more money than you does like, they're, they're, that's always going to be there so constantly getting in the the trap of comparing mm -hmm. yourself to others like that is just it's a losing battle and you're far better off looking at like, okay, everything that does happen in life that it's like, oh, it's happening for me, even if it's a bad thing and it's hard and it's like, okay, where is the opportunity or the silver lining? In this? By the yeah. way, there's uh, great examples of, of people who've overcome, <clears throat> you know, odds where uh, in, in, in most situations, I think a person would say, okay, this is not possible, but the person accepted, you know, their limitations and went for it anyways. One person that comes to mind is a, is a jujitsu practitioner from Brazil, who became a world champion. He's one of the he's one of the <clears throat> legends of jiu-jitsu. His name is John Jacques Machado. Maybe Doug can look him up. He was born with a genetic um Is he like a, have a thumb only in one hand? Yeah, you know who he is. Okay, so yeah. so he in one of his hands was born, he was born with a deformity where he only has like a, a thumb and a pinky. So and he did gi jujitsu. This wasn't no gi where you're grabbing you the gi. Gra yeah. So essentially he did jujitsu kind of one-handed and modified moves and positions to work with his with his hand, with the fact that he lacked fingers in one of his hands, became one of the best jiu-jitsu fighters of all time, one of the most influential jiu-jitsu fighters. Of all. And that's just one example. Mm -hmm. um, but there's lots of examples, um, you know, like like that. There's a, There he is right there. So you can see where he is. Um, like the, what about yeah, the drummer crazy. from, uh, what's what's it called? Um, Def Leppard. Def Leppard, yeah. yeah. Lost his arm, continued being the drummer for a great rock band. Yeah, or the <clears throat> famous um, rock climber that we had on, uh, Caldwell. Yeah, his last name? Yeah, who, yeah, I mean, his his whole, he had, he had to adjust his entire climbing because of it losing, didn't he lose, like, fingers? Well, because yeah. of stories like this, I always find it interesting that we just assume um, that being privileged is the advantage. And I know that's not a popular thing to say because we're, we're in this time where we're all in the oppression Olympics, who's more oppressed and it's constantly like everyone's a victim and we feel and like, oh my God, you have, you have more privilege than me. But it's like, I actually think my experience that if I was more privileged growing up, I think it would have been a disadvantage to me. Now, maybe in the, <clears throat> the short term, it's not when I was young and I was coming up through that. But the the skills that you that you were forced to develop to get through those things have now played as an advantage for me later in life. So when I go back and I think about like, oh, okay, well, this person was more privileged than I was growing up, and I go, would I have rather trade places with them? Like it's such a quick no, no, I wouldn't. Like I see, I see the skill sets that I had to build and develop over that, and I don't think I would have been at an advantage had I been given. Yeah, so much more. And so it's it's funny to me that we just assume 
that, you know, being privileged, having more opportunity, having more money, having more success is necessarily the better thing. Because, mm-hmm. and then you also see examples of uh, suicide rate and drugs and things in the, the, the ultra wealthy. What, what, made, what, what makes everybody think that having all the money in the world, having all the privilege is actually a, is a, is actually a better life? Well, they, act, they have data on this, by the way. It's like once basic needs are met, you don't really get any happier or have more life fulfillment with, uh, with more. But you're right. It's impossible to quantify because, first off, what would be considered a privilege? Uh, let's list all of them. So I could come up with literally, uh, you know, 100 off the top of my head from your height to how smart you are genetically, athleticism, how pretty you are. Whether or not you had money, do you have two parents? Do you have grandparents that are alive? Where you live? I could list like a million and one different potential privileges and then combine them and then add mindset. Now, here's where it gets really crazy because you just said this yourself. This is your story, Adam. Your mindset turned your, what would normally be considered disadvantages into advantages. 100%. And there's a lot of stories like that. Like for me, when I had a really bad health scare in my early 30s, that sucked. It turned me into the person I am today. The voice that you hear on the show today is started from that period. Had that not happened to me, I don't think I would have be here right now talking the way I do. So it's uh, it's you you can't quantify it. Um, you, you really can't compare yourself to other people necessarily. <clears throat> I think the key though is to I think what you said was beautiful. Like things don't happen um, to me; they happen for me. What does that mean? That means when shitty things happen. And you go through it and you process it. You look at it and say, okay, what's the, the opportunity? What's the benefit of this? What have I learned? Where can I grow from this? Otherwise, it's just hard. Mm-hmm. Like something shitty happens to you. If you don't turn it into something positive, it's just shitty. So it's literally up to you to take this thing and turn it into potentially something that could be good for you. Yeah, I don't know how you don't get competitive with yourself that like, there, no, no matter how, because there's plenty of people listening right now that had it way shittier than I do. And that was something that I pieced together too. It's just like, there's plenty of people that had it way harder than me that made it way further than me. Mm-hmm. So I'll, why would I ever want to play the, the the victim or feel sorry for me when I know, and that, that this is true for everybody. Well, Everybody the most- in the worst situation out there, count all the things that happened to you that were so bad. There's somebody else out there that had it worse. Yeah. There's there the always most is. inspirational stories. That's what like most of the movies consisted of with us growing up, <laughs> you know, like uh, people that overcame and defied the odds and, um, you know, POWs for instance, or, or somebody that was like literally like being tortured all the time and made it through because of their, their strong mind. And it's just, I, I feel like that's what needs to be propped and elevated. You know, you just, brought, you just brought something up. Katrina and I were talking about the other night that I thought was interesting. We were talking about like the algorithms with like Netflix and, and the shows and the, the things right. that like the kids are watching today and stuff like that. And she actually made a comment about not, she didn't want to finish Dahmer. And I'm like, why don't you want to finish Dahmer? I hate, I hate that too. Like we're in the middle of something and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like actually into it. And she's like, no, don't you see what it's doing to our algorithm? And I'm like, what? Oh, she's like, look at all, look at all this, now. yeah, look at all the yeah. stuff that it's it's feeding us now that we are watching. She's like, so I'm so not motivated to even watch it because I don't want to be fed that. All right, today's contest: you get to win free access to Maps Powerlift. Here's how you can enter: leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. And then in the comment section, if you're the winner, we'll declare you the winner winner right there in the comment section. You'll get free access to Maps Powerlift. Now, we also have a sale going on this month. Maps OCR and Maps Cardio, both 50% off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below to get yourself set up. All right, here comes the show. You know what you just made me think of is, so let's let's apply this to, to nutrition since this is more along the lines of our expertise. Imagine if there was a food algorithm. So you eat chips or pizza or candy. It's like, oh, you like that. Here's some more of these foods that you're probably going to like, right? What if there was an al- algorithm that you could pick that was like healthy algorithm? So you watch a like a depressing murder series and, yeah. and Netflix is like, okay, you pick the healthy algorithm. Here's some uplifting stuff instead of like stuff like that. So I really right. love the idea of what mm. Freeberg suggested for David Freeberg from the All In podcast suggested for the the Twitter algorithm yeah. future. Like I think that I actually mm. think that that might be the future of a lot of these apps that we have as people become more savvy 
to how how detrimental it can be to continue to to feed yourself this type of content or information that maybe these platforms will be forced to create these self-regulating filters yeah. that now you opt in. So I opt in to Netflix. I go, you know what? Uh, you know, minimize the, the the murder crime stuff. Give me more, you know, overcoming adversity stories or adventure or this and that. And so you can then start to shift the content that is being fed to you because we're becoming more aware of that cycle. But what, where I was heading with that, Justin, that we started to talk about is just, you know, I, I do remember as a kid, like the, the, like the hero story was so different. In fact, it, I don't remember, and, and I could, this could be totally wrong. And this could be just my experience, but it, it seems that <clears throat> in, in the last couple decades, we, there's more and more popular and I'm guilty for liking these too, is the, um, and I forget the name of what you call these movies where we make the villain the hero. Yes, and the anti-hero or yeah, what's that called? Or, like yeah, it's not what it's called. What, you um, know, like, like for example, and and Disney even did that with like 101 Dalmatians. Like they told the Cruella Deville story yeah. from her angle, and you end up falling in love with the yeah. the evil character, the bad yes. character. Like he's like Breaking Bad, and it's yes, it's a lot of these. Like um, yeah, they they glorify, I guess the. Um, you know, somebody that, that kind of like turn goes from being kind of good and then like becomes this ultra villain. Yes. In a sense. Like, I don't remember a lot of those stories as a kid. They were, you know, they were good, good and bad and uh, good over, always prevailed over evil. And that was kind of like the storyline as a child where now I actually see there's a lot of the, the, the heroistic story sometimes is the villain or the bad person. Well, I think that's, that might be more because humans are very complex. And so when they do that, it's not like they're taking someone. There's always an element where they're trying to make you understand them a little bit or like them a little bit for some, you know, from one other reason. Plus, you know, it's not real. So you can kind of like, okay, this is cool. But we're really, you know, humans are really complex. I, I actually prefer that because when you put people on a pedestal, like they're perfect, you know, it's well, like- Well, this, this is the conundrum, right? Because yeah. it, it is programming. So we we were programmed a different way growing up. Like that was something that we started to notice was like you're you're propping all these these people way too high when they're actually flawed, yeah. right? And so it, that became like this isn't real. Like we were always trying to kind of find more real examples to kind of glom onto versus now it's too real or or it's 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 switched kind of roles in terms of like well we've seen everybody fuck up you know and we've seen uh people lie to us like all the time and so now we're getting all these like super exaggerated examples of right. that uh and we're not getting any of like the the good behavior so, examples. I, and, I, and by the way i'm not saying that it was necessarily better when we were kids i'm just saying it's an observation that i've made that like it's it's shifted it's, yeah it's shifted dramatically and i'm not saying one is better than the other necessarily but i do recognize that that was not as as, as prevalent know, as it is today. I wonder if that's because there were stories like that. It's just the difference was the bandwidth was so limited back then. Like back then to tell a really because I couldn't come up with like a really good example. Well, so I'll tell you some, but uh, uh, one that comes to mind. But you know, back then, if you wanted to tell a good story, you did it in a movie, and a movie mm -hmm. typically lasts like two hours, right? So two hour movie. Yeah. If you want to take someone and develop this complex character that you hate and like at the same time, mm -hmm. you need longer than two hours. The Sopranos did that. That was one of the first series to really yeah, do that. That's, that's a good example. Right? And it's like, you know, if you told that story in an hour and a half, it'd be really hard to, to build that story. So I think the bandwidth is longer so we could tell stories more. Books have done this for a long time because books tell long stories. And comic books did this for a long time. Comic it's the classic, books, gangster movies. It's yeah. the classic Batman versus Superman. Bat, the people who like Batman versus yeah. people who like Superman, the difference is people who like the Boy Scout, like the savior, yeah. versus people who like the the flawed human, mm -hmm. you know, who wants to do good, but has also got that capacity for evil. Yeah, the, yeah but the that's punisher to, to me, that's, yeah, or the punisher, to me yeah. that's still different because they're, they're still fighting evil, both those characters, both right. the punisher and Batman. These are people that like, like we've now like, like the Jeffrey Dahmer story, like we've, we've turned bad people into characters that we, we are putting on pedestals. There's a difference, there's a difference between liking Batman and the punisher versus wanting to dress up like Jeffrey Dahmer for Halloween. I don't know. Now. I think like, to me, there's, there's a, there's a clear difference between the way we've, we've, uh, you know, uh, highlighted these, these characters. To I don't me. know. I think that's not a, that's to me, that's not a good example. People are like, we've dressed up as Freddy Krueger, you know, uh, 
uh, serial killers have always had uh, like women writing them letters, love letters in a prison. This has happened for decades. I think people are just fascinated. Yeah. I would say most people don't like Jeffrey Dahmer. I'd say the vast majority of people say, no, I don't like that guy. But it's fascinating and it's interesting. But there's always the phenomenon of the sort of the, the person that's going to uh, mimic them, right, in real life. Like uh, serial killers, when that story prevails, Bro. there's people that will repeat it. I tell there, there was a huge, there was a uh, international team of scientists that was pleading with Western nations, please stop posting these killers' names and uh, specifics on what they did because they often write in their manifestos that that's what they want. They want to go out with a bang. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they said, if you keep letting, if you keep putting them out there in the media, we're going to create, you know, more of these. You know, the first time I remember as a kid, the, like the difference between the superhero that was like invincible and like the regular guy. The first time I watched Die Hard. Do you guys remember that? Mm. When you were a kid? When, when Die Hard came out, the action hero was Arnold, yeah. Sylvester Stallone. They were jacked. Like they uh, couldn't get they hurt. They made him like the the, the, the divorced Van divorced Dan. dad smoking cigarettes. Yeah, he's got like uh, a dad bod. Yeah, yeah, regular balding, dude. dude. Yeah, 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 just... And I remember when I watched it, my dad rented it, and he's like, "Oh, I got an action movie." Because I was you know I was young, I was probably thirteen or something like that. I'm like, "Oh, cool, I love action movies." And I looked at, it, I'm like, "This is stupid." <laughs> he doesn't look that heroic. He doesn't have muscles. And like, what the? <laughs> this is dumb. And my dad's like, "I heard it's good." So I actually watched it as a kid. I remember as a kid, the shift that happened in my brain. Like, as I watched it, I was like, this is really good. Yeah. He's like an everyday guy, you know? <laughs> gives you hope. I could be a hero yeah, one he's day. Saving the, he's saving the, what is it, the building? Nakatomi building or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. people there. Because at that time, it was all the opposite. Yeah, you know? yeah. It, was all, it was all crazy. By the way, bro, comic books were like this for a long time. The Punisher, you brought him up. He was not just a good, he was not a good guy. He was bro. not. He good. would torture and murder. And people. who was I into yeah, but the he, most? But he did it though to bad people though, right? That's his story. They were, but when you, but I know, they were I know. Awesome. He, <laughs> we're like the Wolverine. He applied the same uh, tactics that the, it was just, it was revenge. Like it was like revenge porn. It was yeah. the opposite of like Superman who won't even kill the most evil person. He like refuses to kill anybody. Yeah, yeah. Totally yeah. different. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, it's yeah. just, these are fascinating stories. But I mean. Yeah, I don't, and, and on, and like the whole point of me bringing the conversation up is just, it's more of an observation than it is me making like a sort of strong statement stories. that this is bad or this is good. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I find it interesting. And then I wonder how much it affects just, you know, cause it is yeah. story. Storytelling is powerful as shit. Oh, yeah, I, just, and that, that's, I guess that's my point to the program. I wonder how much is driven by um, actual, uh, like the audience that wants it versus like, you know, what they're actually like subscribing to versus like what's actually being promoted and pushed for, for our acceptance. Dude, I just watched, uh, a series on, I think it was Netflix. You guys will love this. It was about this young girl. It was, uh, it's about drug smuggling. I can't remember the name of the, the series. And I guarantee it's popped up in your- uh, I, may, I may have seen it. What yeah, it? and you might not have watched it. So it's this Irish girl who grew up kind of poor or whatever, wanted to get out of town, get out of her town, her small town, grew, you know, family, 10 kids or whatever. She saves up enough money to buy a one-way ticket to Ibiza. Goes to Ibiza, parties, has a great, super naive- like young, you know, girl. She's like 21 or 22 or something like that. 20 maybe. And she's out there partying, meets kind of like the wrong people or whatever. Some dude, she kind of falls for this dude. He convinces her while she's on drugs and partying or whatever. He convinces her to, hey, go pick up some drugs for me. It's not a big deal. I'll pay 5,000 pounds, which was a lot of money to her. Anyway, it turns out he sent her to Peru. She didn't even know she was going to Peru. Ends up over there, ends up smuggling back a bunch of cocaine. And it turns into this big thing because he... What they do with these drug, uh, uh, what these big cartels do is they will, have, will every once in a while give the police, because they pay the police off, they'll give them a uh, like a, a sting operation uh -oh. to make them feel better. Hmm. So they got caught. Meanwhile, thousands of pounds of drugs are going through over here. So this innocent girl, not innocent because she agreed to do it, but she's naive as shit, goes to a jail in Peru and it's fucked. She's like this, like the worst you could, if you could imagine the kind of girl that would probably get killed in prison, that's her. Yeah, yeah. man. Anyway, she goes in there and she taught, this story is amazing. It, as she's talking about it and the, they interview prisoners, after about a year, she made this shift in mentality, exactly what I'm talking about, where she said, I decided to focus on what I can control and ignore what I couldn't. And I accepted my fate. In the prison there, she made a, a hair salon, was able to make money. Apparently, the way the prisons run over there, that they allow them to run businesses if there's a- This is based on a true story? True story. Oh, it is. This is true. Oh, interesting. She she made a salon in there, made enough money to pay to get in front of the court again to run an appeal hmm. and pleaded with the judge. Or whatever. After three years, she was let out. She was supposed to be in there for 16 years. Wow. And became this like great success story. So oh. it totally reminds me of- 
You so know, it's kind great. of what we're talking yeah. about. It's really, really good. I can't, I don't know the name of it. So maybe, you, Doug you know, find along it. the lines of narratives and talking about these, these big storytelling companies, did you guys see the text I sent over to you guys last night about Disney and gambling and all that stuff like that? Okay. Ooh, so, yeah. so where you say rumors, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, that's, I mean, I've sent over the article. There's articles about they it own now. ESPN. Right? So I, I bought shares years ago. I don't know. They own ESPN, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah, they own wow. ESPN. Um, so I bought I bought shares of DraftKings and I bought shares of um, the Barstool One Pen uh, gambling uh, years just because I see what's happening with sports gambling and it's becoming wild. It was like huge no no forever in sports. I know. And if you, it, if you've been watching sports for the last decade, you've watched the evolution of it being completely uh, demonized for so many years. Now to, you see commercials to for now, it. Well, yeah, now, the announcers talk about the spreads while they're talking about the game. Like, that was never a part of sports. And so, and Disney, for the longest time, has refused to touch gambling. Like, so they've been offered millions and millions of dollars to put gambling on their on their cruise lines. It's very popular to have gambling on cruise lines. Most mm -hmm. cruise lines have gambling, but Disney Disney boats don't. And they won't let them use their Disney characters on gambling because they recognize what what it is, right? It's yeah. like putting it on alcohol or something like that, right? But because they have their, you know, I don't know if you call it their sister company or one of their companies that, that, that are underneath the Disney family. Like ES a buffer. ESPN is in conversations now with DraftKings and working out some sort of deal. And that wow. could be, you know, imagine the the power that Disney has and, and stuff getting behind potentially the the gambling, which is why I sent that over to you guys. Like, hey, just FYI, this was something that I bought years ago. And it's not, I mean, it hasn't exploded yet. DraftKings, I think, trades at like $16 a share, which is pretty, pretty low for right now. And if they actually pair up with ESPN. I know you, you, big, you recommended we buy it. I'm like, yeah. oh, maybe. I know it's a bad. I mean, I don't recommend anyone buy stock right now. I think it's. A, I think right now is a really tumultuous time within the both the stock market and real estate right now. So you know, buyer beware. And I'm not giving anybody stock advice right now. I'm just telling you what I personally did because I follow sports that closely. I also gamble, and so I think that these these gambling companies, if they merge with sports and they start merging with some of the biggest networks out there you i mean it's, it's going crazy. to be like the i don't know it used to just be like a, bl a blatant like conflict of interest right yeah w when you're presenting sports but then you're also like uh you know throwing wagers in there and and commenting on them and like getting so, background information i, I to got me. two two comments on this one is for people who th who still think that companies are you know either good or bad and trying or virtuous to do like no okay the whole reason well, why they money, didn't dude. do gamble gambling, the whole reason why they may do gambling is because of the consumers. We drive that's right. Yeah. What the companies do. The company's job is to make money. They so. couldn't, you know, you know how this got into it? Fantasy. Fantasy football and fantasy sports mm. exploded. Yeah, because that was like accepted gambling. It was. Yeah. It was something that and it became so popular that ESPN and NFL network had to yeah, dedicate it's undeniable. They had to dedicate a a channel of people that literally just want to hear the analyst talk about the fantasy picking, yeah. who to pick up, who's on the yeah, waiver wire, yeah, yeah, yeah. who's All statistics that matter. Yeah, you know, because, I mean, we, like you said, Sal, we've demanded it. There was such a huge popular portion of the audience that was following fantasy sports. And, of course, a lot of people gamble with it. A lot of people pay, like, you put your money in the pot, and then now there's money on the line. Uh, with it, and so I think that was kind of the introduction of a, a accepting gambling. So here's sports. my comment about or speculation or I don't know opinion. I'd love your guys because you guys are much more, especially you, Adam, so deep in this. Gambling has always had kind of a negative, I don't know, relationship with sports because of potential cheating. Right, mm -hmm. boxing is the most common, most famous one where boxers throw yeah, fights. Throw or, fights, uh, but there's famous accounts in sports where a, you know a referee you know kind of call makes a call that's really like i don't know if that was good there's or not been quite a few examples there, of referees. there was a huge controversy in uh there's a great professional doc soccer there's a great documentary yep. on that right now in professional on, soccer on the basketball on okay. the basketball Un ref. untold yeah uh, yeah there's one okay of those. so what do you guys think now because gambling's always you know it's been it's been a lot of money it's had potential influence you know whatever yeah with all this new money flowing in do you guys think that this is going to, that this is a a stronger incentive of course. for sports to be? Of course, yeah, yeah. I, it, I don't think it's ever. So there's a joke in the it, within uh, the my buddies and I that all gamble and stuff like that. I call it the blue phone. 
Mm-hmm. And the blue phone is Vegas. That's what I say. I always say like <laughs> Vegas. And that's, remember, I told you guys a story the other day where I was oh, when, at, at the game and it lands yeah. right on the spread. Like, there's times so. I many wonder th- if they're looking at the spread. Yeah. And they're like, ah, we yeah. See. So I, we always make this joke that like when it when I mean some games are uncontrollable. It shit happens, right? But then there's times where I feel like the game is so close to the spread yeah. that a simple timeout or a, a ref making a call one direction. F- makes it fall on the other yeah. side that that easily. There's irregular calls that you're just like, why would they? Do yeah, you've that? watched things before. You've watched NFL games before where the game is over and yeah. there's no reason you would just kneel it out, but then they kick a field goal. But that field goal was enough to put it over the spread. Yep. And Vegas was heavy on that side versus the other side. And you go like, dude, come <laughs> dude, on. I can- have friends that are completely convinced. So yeah, there's, I, there's you guys like time. you guys tease me or you guys tease you guys about conspiracy theories. I have a conspiracy theory around that that there are definitely times where Vegas makes a call and, and they have they have. I don't think that's funny about conspiracy theory. I think it's just observing human behavior. It, yeah. I, I think it's hilarious that people just write it off right away in conspiracy <laughs> theories when all you're doing is paying attention to human behavior and That's where right. that I, ends up when money is an incentive. I think it's more than plausible. We already have real accounts of this happening many, many, many times in high-level professional sports. Huge controversies. Court Courts got involved. People getting fired. Yeah. Like, it's happened so many times. You really think... And when you it's watch, not going to happen when you again. watch actually yeah. this the the uh, one that Justin's referring to, the Untold on Netflix, the one on the ref. I can't think of his name right now, but I mean, he did it for like I want to say for like five uh, five six years, and he was like one of the best in the game at it. Yeah, and just by subtly, you know, making a couple calls, it's so hard to tell. And how can you pin it on him? It yeah. is. It's too. It's it's really. I forget how he got caught too. I got. I had to go back and watch. It was a really especially good, in a game like soccer where they don't do uh, replays or whatever. And the oh, refs yeah. make the call, and that's it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I it's think it's even is. harder in something like basketball where there's so many points scored. There's yeah. always a like right now. Okay, so this thing. Did you replay in basketball? They do. Okay. But I mean, like you, you got you got two hundred something points yeah. a game are being scored. So that's two hundred opportunities. Yeah, you're right. For you to something's influence. on the line, right? Yeah, and and there's so many calls. It's like, oh, you fouled them. Oh, you know, you didn't. Or and you can really... manipulate the clock so easily by just there like, it is right there blowing the whistle. Operation flagrant foul. Yeah, that's his name right there. Yeah, Tim Donahue. Yeah. Well, for a, for years, bro, for years, he got away with it and flew under the radar without people knowing. And so it's not hard. To, and these are businesses. These are all money making businesses. Huge I mean, NBA, MLB, yeah. you know, NFL. They all yeah, you're not talking. You're not talking about a little bit of money here. Too, you're talking about millions and millions of dollars that are that are getting bet on these games. So yeah, to think that it's yeah, unfortunately, I think it's being in, influenced already. Did you see you know? that the, there's some people saying that uh, the, the fight, Jake Paul fight, with uh, there's this video of when he knocked down Anderson Silva. Yeah. He kind of didn't even touch his face when he went down. Oh, really? Have I you seen it? Oh, I didn't I see it. It looked like he rocked No, him. there was from another angle. Oh, it, interesting. It looked like he did. He like barely brushed across his nose, and then he went down. Oh, man. Do you, so you think that the whole <laughs> news... So the rumor came out. I don't know if it was true or not. This is, again, I'm, I'm speculating on this. I heard that Anderson Silva was... It went, he got knocked out twice by his sparring partners. Yeah. See, look. Jake yeah. Paul's win over Anderson Silva was rigged. Maybe if you click on that, there's a... You know, like what a he, you know what he made last year in boxing? Who? Uh, this is what I like, Doug, to look up. Look up uh, top 20 professional boxers' income. Salary for, or income. For last year. Jake, Jake, Jake Paul made $40 million last year in, wow. in, in, ba- in, in boxing. What? Wow. Where does that place him? I don't know. That's why I'm curious. I have no idea. I, I, like I read Floyd that Mayweather, and I go like- How much did he make? Oh, like yeah. A year, Floyd, Floyd definitely. I mean, hundreds. Floyd had I mean, like 100. He, the, he got the, like 100. The top of that right, pile, right? Right, right. right. But I mean, you're talking about Floyd Mayweather, right? Who is yeah. is is the one of the greatest, most accomplished, greatest yeah, of all time. Yeah. So the fact that someone like Jake Paul could come in and fight a bunch of bums and make forty million, <laughs> dude, you gotta be so mad if you're a, a professional boxer. Yeah. He's like number five. He's wow. number five. Hold well, on, hold on. Well, he's yeah. basically Don King, and he's no, everybody Logan Paul at the same is, time. So we got uh, we got Floyd Mayweather, number one. Anthony Joshua, two. Tyson Fury, three. Deontay Wilder, four. Those Logan are all robots. And then Paul. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. Top five boxer, dude. Yeah. And purses. Just like that. <clears throat> That's insane. It's pretty incredible. That's I mean, crazy. He's done. That's crazy. It, I mean, it's, it's, it is incredible because it's completely shifting an industry. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that had never been done before. To, so to, for us to do this like this and, and then to see that it's going to. And I think what we talked about last time is what's most likely is I don't think it's going to. 
change the sport of boxing per se. Like it's not going to change pr- pr- all the how. It's just another. It's going to be a new thing. Yes, It'll be like yes. the WWF of. Yeah, I, of, agree. Of, I agree. Of boxing, and I think that you'll and and I think people won't give a shit. I think there will be enough people that follow these characters Bro, that go so like, much- I know, I know, it's not the best boxing, but I want to see this dude fight. Yeah. I mean, I want to. Uh, at, at what point do we have our politicians uh, get in the ring? Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. I would just—I'd be into that. I don't care who wins. I just want to see one of them get their ass kicked. Not get it's knocked out. Like get their ass kicked. Yeah, I'll yeah. cheer for that all day long. There's Here's already the lockdown. There's already lots of uh, of these fight like not leagues or competitions around the world that are fucking weird. And because of the internet, they're making a lot of money. For example, the slap. Yeah, the slap is getting big right now. Then there was one I saw where it was they, like they this, tie each other's wrists to this, each other. There was like this big chick, like this big woman. Yeah. And she fought these two like small dudes. So they like trying to jump on her and she's fighting them. <laughs> what? There was one where they were fighting at Justin and I saw this. This was oh. the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. Is it the uh, phone booth? No, that, oh, was, that, was, that was that was hella funny too. Phone, phone booth was my jiu-jitsu. favorite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> or in a so car. Or they, they're in a car and they yeah. fight each other. <laughs> yeah. No, the craziest one I ever saw. They literally had on full medieval armor oh, yeah. and swords. Yeah. They weren't fake swords. Didn't they have platforms too? And they'd like jump off. Oh. I mean, they were fucking each other up yeah. with swords and, and hitting each other with their shield. <laughs> I was like, wow, dude. Yeah. What are you guys doing? Isn't it interesting that like that it's uh, how, uh, I mean, since the Roman times, right? We've been- Since we've, before. Right. Yeah. yeah, even before. You're either in war or you're some form of entertainment of war. Right. You know, like I mean, that's we, what sports is. Sports is the mildest version of that, right? Yeah. I mean, that's because because we got we don't have the Coliseum to death anymore. Football is and boxing, you and, know, and, and MMA is still the animals, man. Like we can't get we can't shed that part of us. I, is that know, what I it like is? It. Is that what it is that that, that that draws us to that? Is is just purely yeah, there's an, an evolutionary tribal and we want to fight. There's an evolutionary advantage to having a level of that, right? Because for mo- most of human history. If you had your tribe and the, and food was scarce and there was another tribe, you had to have those guys that were like, I'm going to go and fight them. And, you know, because that's what helped us survive. So I think it's cool when it's controlled and there's rules, which is our civilized way of taking these instincts right. and not letting them turn into actual insane war, which we still do, although, you know, far less than we used to. So that's, you know, but I mean, look, look let's be honest. I mean, we all got in a lot of fights when we were kids. Yeah. I hated him. But they were also exhilarating at the same time. Yeah. I hated them, and then afterwards, especially oh, if yeah. I won. Sure. Afterwards, I was like, yeah, was exactly. Cool. <laughs> but but what was we- interesting about it was like there was like a mutual respect, though, for the most part. When I'd get in a fight with somebody, yes. and we were done, and then we yeah. just kind of like acknowledge each other at that, like, okay, we worked it out. Yeah. You know, I feel like there's so much less of that now. Like nobody ever works it out. Yeah, yeah. That one sh- that one documentary I showed you a long time ago it was Knuckle. That showed those Irish uh, oh, yeah. travelers. Oh uh, yeah, I watched yeah, that. And they just—that's how they just settled. Brutal. Their yeah, yeah. They just, still like that over there. Yeah. They, I, I don't know, but they'll pick like a like a family, like a representative from each family, and then they have rules, and they actually enforce the rules, and they have them fight, and then they they bet money on it, and that's it. Is there anything from like th- those time, like back way back in the times, that you wish that we were more of today? I I I do wish mm. there was more honor. Yeah. In that kind of stuff. Mm. Because like what you know, like my like look the way my grandfather and father grew up it was rough. Like my dad, he grew up real poor in Sicily, and the the police weren't really involved unless something major happened. And half the time they were paid off by organized crime, so you kind of had to handle your own shit. Mm-hmm. And people would fight, and if somebody showed up with a weapon, then the whole town was like, "That's not fair. You can't." So it's kind of like, "Oh, it's fair." It's a fair fight. Let them do their thing and, and figure it out. That doesn't happen so much now, right? It's more like sneak attack, weapons, yeah. shoot. And I know. think the the whole, like, your word is your bond. You know, that's like a really old yeah. principle that people used to share. And for some reason, because of uh, the information age and technology and being autonomous. and That's it. You know, the, the autonomy of it, like not being who you really are, like having any, any responsibility for your actions, uh, whether it's what you say, what you do, like, uh, you know, physically. Um, it, the thing is, I just feel like we can we can just dismiss that a lot now and, and be able to get away with just shitty behavior without consequences. You, we had societal pressures because towns were small. Yeah. So if you shook hands oh, with no, the baker. Oh, no, you said that. Yeah, you shook hands with the baker and you say, I'll pay you, and then you don't, and then the town knows about it, you're a pariah. 
Yeah. Nobody's going to do business with you. Yeah. We have to have like the law now and, and you know, actual signatures because I yeah, guess we're so big, too big. Yeah, yeah. You could rob a baker and then live in that town and never get, no one would even know that. Yeah. You, did that. you develop a re reputation before and then nobody wants to work with you. Nobody yeah. wants to do anything with you because you're that coward. You're that person that backed out of the deal or whatever. So, you know, speaking of bets, don't you owe me a car at some point? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, wow. We still got that going. Uh, it's coming. Don't worry. <laughs> no, it's coming. I never it's want it so I can bring it up all no, the time. No, no. <laughs> We're almost there. We've almost arrived. We've you almost should... arrived that I could, I could <laughs> buy a car as a fucking joke. You know what I'm saying? Dude, I'm still waiting for the bet where somebody has to like get a tattoo or something, dude. That'd oh, be, God. That'd be fun. Oh, oh that's crazy right yeah, there. I think, a, I think a funny little clown car, that's a smart I know what you're going to do. You're going to buy a piece of shit. I'm going to buy you a- going to cost me money to I'm going to buy you a fucking little smart car. It's going to be a wagon. And I'm going to plaster your face on it or something. No, dude. Yeah. It's going to do Spend something. money on it. Yeah, yeah, I fucking yeah, will, bro. Like, yeah. I will. That's was, hilarious. For this podcast, ends, we will definitely, I will have given hey, you a car. Hey, eyelashes. Speaking and, of cars, yeah. uh, obviously this is going extinct, but manual transmissions, right? So hard to find. So hard to find. My buddy just bought a sick Corvette and I asked him, I'm like, D did you get a manual? And he's like, no. You they don't even make them probably. They don't. I'm like, so lame. Yeah, Dude. I got I got a list of cars here. It's the ultimate deterrent for getting your car stolen. That's right? what police will tell you. Yeah, yeah. they say Get if you drive a stick shift. shift, no one's going to steal it. I got a bunch. Of, I got a list of cars that still offer manual. So there's a like the supercars Porsche 911. There's the CT5 V Blackwing, the yes, Cadillac. That's sir. the one you guys liked. Uh, there's another pay that came in GT4 Porsche Boxster. Then there's a Mazda Miata. That's a sick shift. <laughs> That's what I might buy you. You can have I that I might one. buy you a Mazda hey, Miata, dude. Hey, you make, a, make fun of me all you want. <laughs> you want it one That would time. be fun. Oh, no. Just to take it and just wreck it? Yeah, I think that would, that would be just power such a slide. popular You would car enjoy that one too much because it's convertible and stuff yeah. like that. I can see, you, you, would, you would own that one. <laughs> <laughs> Smart car, I'm going to make you a drive. you know, like kicking uh, the, the Sarah McLaughlin Subaru tunes. BRZ. Yeah. I mean, there's a few cars that, you know, Hyundai Elantra. Very, yeah, very few. Yeah, there's a, there's a Honda uh, Civic that they come, they come the S oh, Type Oh, the, the, the Civic Type R. Yeah, yeah the Type R, Type R. Not yeah, type they still S. have Volkswagen GTI. Yeah. I love stick shift. You know what, though? Back in the day, stick shift was faster than automatic, but they make the automatic timing so much better now. It's actually faster. Oh yeah. Well yeah. yeah. You have to be you have to be really good at launching. I mean I feel like it's kinda always been that way. Even when I had a stick as a kid and I my buddy would beat me a lot of times. He had we both had the same kind of car. And he had an automatic, and I had the stick. And uh, he, because unless you have, if you're really good at launching, you have to really know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. You not spin your tires out. You spin your tires out, and then the automatic is. going to You know, I was you. thinking a good way if you're worried about your kid texting while driving, buy him a stick shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then they got they got to keep their. Hands I mean, I actually keep some busy. So sure. I learned uh, when I was 14. I learned how to drive on a stick, and then my first two cars were you know, were mm -hmm. stick. And I actually think that that has that. Now here's the yeah, word. you got to bring that back. Yeah, I, I mean, it makes you so much more alert. I remember, I vividly remember the, like the first day of like learning to drive and, and ever, and you're, you're so focused as a kid doing the clutch and the shifting that I would like look down and then I'd, be, <laughs> I'd be drifting in the other lane. <laughs> they got, we lived on the country, right? So it was yeah. okay, right? No cars coming or like that. But I remember that was oh every God. time I do it, it would like drift over The first over time you, you get like stalled on a hill. Oh, oh yeah. bro. How nervous Ooh, you remember you the first time you drove oh, sweat and bullets. a stick shift in San Francisco? Oh yeah. yeah, I did that. Literally, it was like three months after getting my driver's license. When I was I'm in like, high school, go to San Francisco. Yeah. Oh, oh, when I was God, in anxiety. high school, I would I would drive only in certain areas because there was there's like in fact there was a grocery store in our town that was like down in this bowl, and I would never go there because I know that that possibility of getting I would stuck. get stuck on this hill <laughs> and you had to go out across this like oh, double terrifying like yeah. highway area. So burn like, out on accident. Oh my God, it was like terrifying. Did you guys learn how to do it like the the beginner way, right, with the handbrake? Is that how you guys learn how to do? Oh, that? on the hill, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that's the beginner way. Oh no. So my, so I, I, yeah, I my dad said, look, I'm going to show you this now, but you got to learn how to do it the right way. But just in case, he goes, when you're up in the hill, put it in. You go in neutral, put it in the bat, and put the handbrake up, and then start. Uh, so you first, have it. You're so start it's adding pushing, some, pushing, and then take the handbrake. Then you off. take the handbrake off. And and oh that. yeah, no, I never did yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, so you, don't, you don't fall back. Otherwise, you do the half foot thing, right, where your foot's on the on the you know yeah, the brake yeah. and the gas yeah, and the clutch, yeah. you know, type of deal. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I went to San Francisco three months or so after getting my license. And That's I was way nerve wracking right? because the other thing about San Francisco is learning the one way streets. Like if you've never been in a town or didn't grow up like around, like yeah, I still you can that. never turn left dude, yeah. in San Francisco without without Always navigation. Oh. I was following Katrina just and she had Max. Was freaking she turned down the one way and then I come right behind her. I was like, oh shit, we're on the wrong side. I don't even remember where we were at, but. Yeah, if you're not familiar with that area, or I think we're in Oakland. If you're not familiar with that area and you don't know about one ways, and San Francisco is all like that, dude. Yeah. Wow. So, all right. So, Adam, I want to ask you this, just to change gears here. 
you have the most experience using the Juve red light for hair regrowth. Yeah. There was a period of time there. Well, I actually wasn't, that was like a side effect. I don't know if you remember this, but I remember telling you, I don't know if we, I don't think we talked about it on air, but I was using it way back when for the testosterone and psoriasis. Mm -hmm. But I remember telling you that I felt like I noticed my hair and then it was you who came back right. and then told me that That's there right. was research to support that. Really good research. But I wasn't doing it for that. That wasn't the main reason. I just had the, I had the full panel and I would sit there in my like office chair and Look I'd on sit your there. Phone. Yeah. yeah. I totally would. I would be like this on my phone and just come 20 minutes sitting there in front of it. And then I remember like feeling my head going like, God, I feel yeah. like I'm getting like the, it reminded me of when I was messing with, uh, what's that, Bosley or what? Oh, what's like that? Minoxidil? Yeah. yeah. I, I remember I would feel like this like peach fuzz growing back when I was trying that. So the best research on red light therapy, like the most, like the strongest research is for skin, uh, like how it makes your skin look like with wrinkles and healing and hair. Hair regrowth is like definitely, definitely, definitely works according to the data and the research. So the reason why I'm bringing this up, so Jessica had, she made these, these photo album books. Really nice, right? Where they, I don't know if you, 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 I don't know if you guys know you could do this. You could get, cause everything's digital. You send your picture. There's a website you go on and she puts the pictures on like this book and then they print it and mail it to you. It's really nice. You Shutterfly? Yeah, Shutterfly. Okay. So I saw like, <laughs> like a total since the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, anyway, we have them from like, crazy technology. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's going. this box, great yeah. too. Yeah. guys. There's thing. this box. Yeah. You hit a button, yeah. and then you see things, yeah. but and it looks like there's people inside, <laughs> but they're not really in there. I checked. I opened it, dude. So anyway, we got all these like these photo books uh, all the way back from 2016, and my son Aurelius loves loves them for whatever reason. So the other day I was uh, I went to the bathroom real quick and then he was real quiet. I'm like, uh oh, you have a two year old and shit gets quiet. Usually that's bad news. Anyway, I go in, he's on the couch yeah. and he's going through the book. Oh, cute. So I go and I look at them with him and I hadn't looked at them, like really looked at them. And uh, my daughter comes home and she goes, wow, look how much hair you had, dad. Oh, I'm like, oh. oh. I'm like I know it's happening slowly. Okay. Oh. Maybe. So I'm going to start using it, I think, uh, on a regular basis. Oh, to, there you go, dude. To try to, I know. I actually love the, the skin. Like, the, my, I feel like, and I can notice it right one time. One time of doing it, well, afterwards, your skin looks like it's glowing. It yeah. almost looks mm -hmm. like I was in a uh, like a, a, tanning, a tanning bed for yeah, a few yeah, minutes. Yeah. That's what it feels like afterwards. Yeah, so it's, it's got a, a different. Speaking of my son, he turns two today. Today yeah. is his birthday. Happy uh, birthday to him. Bro. Hey, so, okay, so what is, so, so, so love, I, love I meant to ask you this because yesterday I was playing with my son and we were, uh, he has this huge dinosaur book he absolutely loves. And I was trying to remember, I was thinking about your son because I knew his birthday was coming up and I was like, you know, I wonder if Aurelius is getting into dinosaurs yet because I remember Max was about one and a half and he became infatuated with dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Is he into dinosaurs? And you were into dinosaurs when you were a kid. I was huge into dinosaurs and sharks. Uh, he likes cars, trucks, and buses. Yeah. Loves them. Loves them. Yeah, so when we I drive, a kid. when he's getting like antsy in the back seat, I open his window and I'm like, look, a truck. Look, a bus. Look, and he just loves it. It's his favorite thing to do. Oh, wow. His favorite day of the week, and this is just perfect how it works. So garbage today's man. his birthday. It's also the day the garbage trucks. Yeah. Yep. Isn't that funny how kids love that? They love it. Yeah. So my, he my buddy Chris, stoop. who I'm, I'm, I'm talking to today, like he has to go up there out religiously. That's like, the, he's like, yes. now he's trained his son on what days. And if he doesn't, his kid will flip out. So yes. he has to go out there and they have, they live like in these townhouses and he's got to let the trash guy get all the trash cans and, and the kid wants to just sit there and just watch. Oh, them. they honk at him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that they, they know him now and they honk at him. So, and you know, part of it, I'm like, wait a minute, honey, are you out there with him? She's like, yeah. I'm like, Hmm. Like, the garbage me, me, guys me. honking at you. So, <laughs> so Katrina, that's it, so weird, right? So Katrina and I were talking about Ooga. this and I had, I was into uh, uh semi trucks. That was my thing. And I, so, so I remember I had this, you know, what's the, uh, what's the brand? Doug probably remembers this brand. It's Tonka. a Tonka. No, 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 no. Semi, semi like this, mm. like the oh, diesel trucks. Your belt? No. No. The, it, the, the orange ones that, that, that uh, take people's uh, furniture and stuff like that. It's called, uh, starts with, uh, it's, it's all orange and then it has like, uh, like stripes that go run diagonal on it. Oh. It's been, it's I a company that's it. been around forever. I know you guys United? know it. Huh? No. No, I can see it now. Yeah, I cannot believe I can't think of the the and name. You buy the toys of that brand. Yes, mm. and it was like a. And as a kid, I knew I, I didn't know until later as an adult what that toy was. I remember seeing like these moving trucks. Older, I'm like, I had toys of a of, of a moving truck. Yeah, of a moving <laughs> like, how lame is that? Yeah, yeah how <laughs> lame is that? I'm like, I had no idea oh. what it was until way later. Oh, I was in the same thing. I mean, with like concrete, brown, orange, and yellow trucks. are the colors. 
brown, orange, and yellow, and they're and it's a and they're and like John Deere tractors and everything. I was into the big like earth mover ones though. You know the big what are those called? There's a name for those. I forget. What uh, they're called. Like a U a U it starts with a U. I thought it was called an earth mover. They're like a dump truck, but they're like way oversized. I so I just looked up orange truck toy and it don't look toys up it wasn't like a normal toy that's it was like a moving company and i had the i had their their semi truck that i played with forever it's gonna drive me crazy yeah we gotta have to find out what this orange is. moving company is it penske oh i think it is penske let me see what it looks like can you show me let me look it up right now it's gonna drive me crazy you have to use <laughs> really important it might be penske dude yeah i think you're right it's like orange orange brown and yellow colors yes Yes. Oh no, or is it hurts? No. Allied. No, it's allied. Al oh, allied. Allied, right here. How'd you uh, guys? Yeah. It was I, I. I put up moving trucks that are orange. It was like all over. Well, it popped I mean, up. your phone listens to you and does all your shit. It knows everything. <laughs> yeah, it was allied. <laughs> okay. Wow. That, oh uh, yeah, I remember that. You still with have the one, and it has like this. My grandma might have still have it somewhere. You got to give it to your boy. I just think that's hilarious that it was like I was hardcore into that toy that I, I can remember all the way back to almost his age of playing. Is that your favorite it. toy? It was. Do you know what my favorite toy was? Do you guys remember? Th this is back when it was cool to play with toy guns, which I, I still think is cool. But oh, so it's not brown. So it's black. It was allied. Yeah. Okay. Do you guys remember those toy guns that shot the discs? Yes. Yeah. That was my. Were awesome. That was my favorite because the discs. Kind of hurt when you hit them. Yeah, they whipped. They yeah. whipped out. Mm -hmm. So it was fun to shoot. When my I siblings think back of guns that yeah. were actually cool as a kid, that I because you know, remember you remember as a kid too, some of the guns were just like lame. Yeah, yeah you want to actually shoot. You shoot it. You're, 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 you're yeah. dude. <laughs> like, no. Especially water guns. Like if you had the ones that are like these plastic, it had the little like you had to like fill them up upside down and then plug it in. It like only would shoot out this far, and then super soakers came out. Remember when like, I brought that guy up? Yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the the engineer or whatever like that 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 patented that and and made. made bajillions of dollars yeah, off yeah. of being yeah, the super like soaker a, guy. I, I used the water weenie before the super soaker came out. <laughs> Remember that thing? You wrap around your waist. And until yeah. it, it breaks. Yeah. Yeah. My dad had a, a, an industrial, like commercial length water hose. So, you know, the ones that are hella long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we had hella water pressure at my house because I don't know what he did, but you know, he liked it. <laughs> so I don't, this is, by the way, I don't know. I think this is like a an old school Italian thing because I've, I've seen memes about it, but they all like to wash their yard with their hose. Just, Washing the, the front. Just like a wash thing. it off. Yeah. But anyway, he had this really long hose. So when we'd have big water fights in the back in the in the neighborhood, I'd come out with this long ass hose, hook it up, and <laughs> I could cover like two or three houses with that. Yeah, but you wanted to find like any kind of little weapon or something that hurt just enough. Yeah. <laughs> like even if it was snap and pop. Otherwise it wasn't fun. Yeah, we would take our shirts off and throw snap and pops at each other and it would like explode. Yeah, if there's no marks. consequences of getting shot, it's not that it's not that fun. It's stupid. Yeah, have to, there has to be some consequence, which Should is why I think pain. paintball and airsoft ended up. Airsoft being so went big. crazy now, and I get it. You yeah. know, that's why I was like a little apprehensive about it, but then I'm like, I totally get it. I would have been into it. Speaking of weapons, did you guys know that shotgun ammo can be made into crazy, exotic, weird shit? Did you guys know this? Well, huh? you just brought it up Done. and, and Google blew my mind. Exotic shotgun ammo. So what? I I, so I didn't know this until a while ago. I was on YouTube, and there was this dude that was like testing all these different. Now I'm familiar with like a slug, right? That's like a big one, yeah, big like buckshot. Bullet. Or there's double aught, right? Yeah. Which is the 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 balls, like the a balls. few of those balls, the heavy balls. There's bird or shot. Bird shot. I mean, yeah. And then there's like variations of each. I thought that was it. No, no. Apparently, there's all kinds of crazy different types of uh, of of ammo, one of them is called Fire's Breath, where it literally shoots out flames, and they'll have like a dummy, and they'll demonstrate it, and you're like, you could set someone on fire at <laughs> this what? shotgun show. There's another one that's called a are they legal? Yeah, well, not in California, nothing's legal here. Yeah, but in some states, there's one that's called a, a flechette round, and it shoots little spears <clears throat> oh, out of man. the out of the out of the shell. What? That's crazy. There's another one called a bolo round. It's got two lead balls with a with like a wire connecting them. So you shoot it and it's just and it like, <laughs> spinning. Like it hits you. <laughs> oh fuck you <laughs> like up, a dude. Fucking, Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah, that would like cut into you. It yeah. just it's just they're wild, crazy rounds that oh, you can buy. Weird. There's one called a fifty cal BMG. I wonder what would be the I would think the buckshot would be one of the best for home protection, right? The, well, so there's there's a lot of controversy over that. So buckshot definitely uh especially if you're at relatively close range. Each one of those hits with the force of a nine millimeter or, or close to, Ooh. right? From what I read, someone's going to correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. But it's like devastating, right? A slug. 
especially at close range is like it's like a cannon. Yeah. But, but you got to say for home defense is they say that you got to be careful because that goes through the walls. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so I've heard arguments for people who say use birdshot, but birdshot's not going to really kill anybody. Yeah, so what I read, I read this article and this guy said, it, when you load your shotgun, the first round is birdshot. The second one is buck. Mm -hmm. So the first one's like, boom. And it's the guy keeps coming at you, not scared. Then you hit him with the next one. Oh yeah. Type of deal. But that's too much thinking. I don't you know? know. Yeah. I've heard arguments, but I mean, in terms of it, like, you want to have a lethal, if you're going to be shooting somebody, you want it to be lethal. You that's don't want to mess around. Yeah. Otherwise, you're giving them the opportunity. Then you shot me. Now I'm going to kill you. It's just like, what are we doing here? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Do you shoot somebody with a freaking? If buck you're going to commit to shoot somebody, yeah, yeah, it's true. You know what are we? What are you even doing at that point? Yeah, it's true. Well, you I, just, mean, I, you know, I mean, I get your point. I get, but I feel like if someone, if someone, some guy, let's say, creeps in and he's holding like a nine millimeter, so with that, I come around the corner with my bird shot and I fucking, <laughs> yeah, you're fucking, fucking <laughs> blast. I'm pretty sure he's going to drop the gun. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> pretty sure he'll drop the gun. He might or might not. I mean, if I, he has a leather jacket on, and it, it, it's not going to go through the leather jacket. He'll it feel does it. it. Not bird shot. It won't go. Are not you sure about that? Positive. That, you have that a true? thick leather jacket that ain't going to go through. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. I yeah. didn't know that. I yeah. thought I thought it would. We got you know we have gun enthusiasts. Although right by now. the they're way, either I know, yeah, they're, they're, I know, dude. It's or you they're, know they're what? Like, hey, oh, you know what? Don't fuck you. Go get your own show. I hate. I hate when I we, yeah. we, I can't talk about MMA. I can't talk about anything because there's uh, always some expert stay in your on, lane. There's always somebody an expert online who's well, just so like, my, hey, go start your own podcast. Talk with your buddies. So my sister's longtime. We have a podcast. Nobody listens. Well, so my sister's longtime boyfriend. He's a he was in the military for years. He's a police officer. I had this conversation with him about home defense and stuff like he said the most important thing you need to consider when you buy a gun for home defense is that you're super well versed in it that you yeah. practice it so often yeah. that under states of extreme stress or duress seems kind of like common sense that you can handle it a lot, actually a lot of people don't think of that they think oh I got this gun but they're not so like he says you got to be so comfortable with it you could do it in the dark eyes closed it's like, you know, it, the safety it's like, you know it's to, like right. buying a freaking supercar but not being able to drive very yeah. well it's like kind of common sense yeah. to me well it's worse like, than you that probably shouldn't, fall back shouldn't buy the thousand horsepower car if you, well, you know what he recommended well. he said if unless you're going to practice all the time all the time he says a revolver a classic revolver is pretty good because it's hard to mess up. Mm -hmm. There's not like a safety. Easier to load. Yeah, yeah. not a safety or whatever. It's there and you just, you know, pull the trigger and it, it's still good. The only thing really? that's what they say, huh? He said that. He's, because anybody, like, because guns have safeties and stuff. And yeah. if you're not super well versed and you're stressed out and you point and you're not doing the safety right or whatever, I mean, the guy could take the gun from you and then you're, especially if it's your wife, right? With the revolver, that's it. You that's why, you know, I, the biggest thing I think is being able to aim that thing, man, especially with the kick on a revolver and stuff like that. I would, oh, that's why I think good... a shotgun is like the, the, the way to go. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said, he actually told You're not me. not likely to miss. Yeah. I asked him with the shotgun and he said that um, he has lots of stories of when they cock the shotgun, the guy leaves. Yeah. From not not in front of you, he's like around the corner. And you no, say, I have a gun. Ch -ch -ch no, I've, I've heard that. I've heard yeah. it. That's why it's one of the best. Is literally just because the fear of like you know they know like an intruder knows that too. If I'm an intruder and I'm and I'm carrying a nine millimeter, like the thing I would be worried about is the, a Dude. fucking someone carrying a shotgun. Do you guys have a buddy? I think everybody has a buddy like this. Do you guys have a buddy that's like way over prepared? Oh, yeah, like, of course, to, dude, like what yes. are you doing, bro? Yeah. Are you gonna, uh, you're not going to get attacked like, by <laughs> as like the a, cartel. night vision and you know <laughs> just like all the tactical gear. Of like, dude, when are you ever going to use it? Can you that? imagine she's this burglar I wonder what, you He know, shows up around the corner with night vision. What, yeah. what, is it, what are the statistics the on like intruders like that? Like, what is it? In, how does it end up? Like, like the like uh, statistically, does an intruder normally have a gun? Do they normally end up wrestling with the owner? Does it normally turn into a knife type of fight? Does it normally turn into just a physical it's, altercation? It's rare that an intruder will break in when you're home. It's very rare. Yeah, that would be a dumb. Right. That's and, majority and then, time and then when they do. How often are they confront? Do they create the confrontation? They or usually they leave. They usually yeah. want to get out. Right. They don't want to get caught. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting if you're getting attacked, that's part of the what they want to do. Is yeah, they're there to they've attack. been stalking you to attack you, basically. Yeah. Right. But it's rare. It's actually quite rare. Usually they they go in when you're not home. You know that most common time because everybody thinks at night everyone's gonna break into my house at night. It's not middle of the day. Yeah. It's Is middle, that true? Yes. Really? Because everybody's at work. The, yeah, the, the, that's the thing. Like, you, you just got to pay attention to people that are constantly kind of driving around your neighborhood. Because a lot of times they'll, they'll just be there scouting, picking up patterns. So that way they know, like, when you leave for work. And it, we're pretty predictable. Well, so we're my business. Well, we make it so obvious now with apps. You know, yeah. Say, yeah. You check into a restaurant across town and you're yeah, not a look at your Facebook. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I, my, where my business was in Los Gatos, this is a very wealthy part of the Bay Area, like one of the richer towns. That's where I had my wellness studio. 
there was a period of time there where there was this like rash of home burglars. And these are like really nice, super wealthy uh, neighborhoods. And it was like a, it was like a gang and they'd scope out these houses. Mm -hmm. They'd figure out when people weren't home, they'd know where to look and what to get or whatever. And they, there was like four or five of these break-ins that happened within a, like a, a year period. Mm -hmm. It was like a big deal in the town back then. So what was that documentary that just went out with the two, the two kids that were robbing all the famous people and stuff like that oh, up in the Hollywood right. Hills. Was it like Paris Hilton or who, yeah, who they were hit, They were hitting like, Paris Hilton. I brought that up on the show. I remember you talking about that was that. like, that was super interesting to me too, that they were like, they got away with that for like years. They, yeah. They were just, because they would just do like one item at a time yes. and just uh, it, real expensive, but they just didn't feel it because mm -hmm. they, they, thought they so, lost it. They, they weren't they, paying attention. Yeah. They thought they lost it because yeah, it was well. like, Oh, she'd come home in her purse at thousands of dollars of that is cash and so they she doesn't just, even keep track yeah <laughs> oh, they were they were disciplined they had, she had like a safe full of like you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of jewelry but they knew better than to take all of it and they would just pluck one or two things yeah one or two things of value and just keep getting it out of there and they just they got away with it for you know a, what that reminds a, me of do you guys remember that plot that was the bling ring oh the bling ring. bling ring by the way the one i talked about where the girl got caught smuggling the drugs was called high that's a great high. yeah great okay. do you guys remember that plot remind me of that plot i think it was superman 2 or three, I don't remember, where uh, there was like a computer program that would take like fractions of a cent of, of each transaction. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, that was also, also an office space. Yeah. Yes, that, as I say, that was another fucked up with the decimal point. <laughs> oh, shit. He, did, he fucked up the math, right? Is that what he did? He, met, he God, fucked up I the love decimal that movie point? so much. Yeah, oh, that's such a good movie. Oh, <laughs> He's like, oh, shit. <laughs> he wakes up the I'm next I'm going to be somebody's bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so good. All right, we're supposed to mention Felix Gray uh, in, in today's episode. I do want to say one downside to Felix Gray. I don't know if you guys have noticed this. Do you guys ever put them on at night to watch a movie and you can't finish the movie because you start to fall asleep? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one thing. It makes you tired. Okay, so that's why I have... So they have their they have their daytime and they have their nighttime and yeah. there is a clear which is folk so and I actually it's can gonna time it out right so yeah. I can see the day like I don't know if you guys do this not because I actually have like three or four pairs and I have the the days and the nights and um I I have the same frame and in in in, in, in one, or one, same style in uh, these two and I, sometimes I make the mistake and I put uh, the, the, night ones the on? nighttime ones on because unless you like really look at the lenses it's hard to tell because they're not colored or anything like that but i do notice if, if you go back and forth you can see a, a, a difference and yeah. so there's something that 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 the it's nighttime is, is it blocks way more it's blue thicker so, and the so day even when i'm watching tv it, it has a different like my eyes receive it differently and and if i've got it on for 30 minutes at night like nine ten o'clock at night it'll make me drowsy that's it 30 minutes i timed it it's yeah. 30 to 40 minutes drowsy. and that's it i want to yeah. go night night so that so the day ones block the dangerous blue light but allow some blue light in to keep you invigorated so use it at work in front of your computer you're not gonna fall asleep which is cool because and this is how i do it it's like so if i don't want to fall asleep and i'm still working on the computers with that i'll put the daytime ones on right and it won't make me drowsy and sleepy now now, if I'm like watching TV to like, sometimes we do this, like Katrina and I, it's 9, 30, 10 o'clock and we're like, oh, we're still a little awake. Let's wind down while we'll watch TV. And I really don't care if I start to get drowsy. I'll put the nighttime ones on and then by like 30 minutes of watching the show, I'm like, I can't get past 30 minutes. I start, uh, I'm like, oh, it's these glasses. No, there's, yeah. I mean, they work. It's super effective for sure. I'm glad you went that route because I was just going to say, you don't have to have like a man bun to wear uh, it feels great, <laughs> wow. which is great. Wow. It's a good it's wow. a benefit. Wow. Why would wow. you need a wow. Usually, that's what you get. Wow. Oh my god! Dude. Always so insulting. They're going to use that yeah. commercial on their, yeah. on their advertising. Yeah. 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 It's no man, no, no man buns required. <laughs> Hey, check this out. There's a company we work with called Bio Optimizers. They have great products and supplements. One of my favorites is their Masszymes, digestive enzymes. You take them when you eat to help you digest your food and assimilate more amino acids from your protein, essential fatty acids from your fats, and turn your carbohydrates into energy. But they have many other products. And from November 1st, excuse me, from November 21st to the 28th, you can get all of their best-in-class products for 25% off. It's their Black Friday sale. Go check it out. Go to buyoptimizers.com. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S.com forward slash mind pump. Then use code mind pump 10 during that period of time. Again, remember 21st to the 28th of November for 25% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Jason Snurb. Are overhead farmer walks worth incorporating into my workout? I feel like that's a made up last Schnurp. name. Yeah. I, All no, right. I, I, had, I wanted to say. What it. program did we do that in? Did we do that in performance or did we do that in strong? Uh, we did it in uh, performance. Yeah. Uh, 
so first off, overhead holds, isometric holds are extremely valuable. They're extremely valuable for stability and function. So it really makes you stronger in that particular position of a of, of a of a range of motion. Range, strength and control. Yeah, but, but talk also, about talk about the why that is in 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 comparison to many other because we okay, in range of motion strength is important for all muscles yeah. and joints. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in particular, that one is uh, is even more valuable, in my opinion, because of how many people lose the mm. ability to even extend their arm up next to their ear and above their head. And, and a lot of people, when they do overhead presses, don't hold that top position very long. Don't fully extend. Can't even do it. They can't even do it. We actually had body, but we had a we had like a, a, a high level you know, pro physique competitor. Pro physique guy. Yeah, do some exercises for some of our videos. He had a tough time full extended because he never trains in that particular way. Now from a muscle development standpoint, anytime you make anytime you address a weakness in your your in a particular muscle's ability to contract or or have strength, you're going to see improvements. And that's an area I had tremendous benefit from doing this. This is when I first met you guys and Justin uh, I think we all worked out together and he had us do these overhead kettlebell carries and I was really bad at them. I found I was like, "My god, I'm really fatiguing." So I incorporated it in my shoulder workout. I would do like one set. And uh, my overhead presses got stronger. My shoulders got way more developed. I, I got more stability. So, so I think it's super valuable. Yeah. It doesn't cause a lot of damage either. So it's really cool. You could just add it to your workout, and not cause too much damage uh, to the well, body. Well, there's value to different methods of training, but I feel like strength athletes, like really, this is something that is v massively beneficial in terms of like compartmentalizing different parts of movements and lifts. Um, and, you know, really focusing in on some of those weak points. And so having that, that extended range of motion, that's um, a lot of times, like you had mentioned, like people don't go to that full extension. Um, and for some reason out there too, it's, it's uh, some people are, are, are afraid to do that thinking that it's going to be hard on their joints and bad for their joints. I'm glad you said that. I mean, they'll say it's the elbows, right? Oh, right. I protect my elbows. You don't, straighten your arm out and lock it so that it rests on the elbow joint. You have to maintain tension. tension muscle tension. Yeah, that's, that's so controlling you, don't, you it. don't set it on the joint. That's where you could cause problems. You have to hold it up there. Yeah. So that's, it's definitely, there's definitely, um, you know, technique to it and being able to learn how to pack your shoulder correctly so that way you distribute the force appropriately so it doesn't sit and rest in the joints of the shoulder and, uh, and, the, and the elbow. Um, so, yeah, so it's, I mean, in terms of all of that, you see that that then translate when you go to do uh, an overhead press with a barbell, like how much more um, strength is now applied because uh, you don't have any of that instability or uncertainty uh, that's feedback bringing it back to where like you start losing force production. So yeah. if you don't feel like you're familiar uh, with that portion of, of the exercise, you lose a, a bit of, of force. So yeah. I would do these to start my workout. So if someone's asking if you don't have MAPS performance, you're not following one of our programs and you want to program it into your program, is it would be like a like a primer for me. I would do, you know, one to two walks back and forth. Have you ever done it at the end? I have, but why I get a crazy pump when I do. So why I like it before though, especially if I'm doing a full body routine or I'm definitely doing upper body stuff. When I get into my shoulder pressing and my chest, um, waking up all those stability muscles in the joint, uh, have served me time and time again in bench pressing like that mm -hmm. for me, uh, bench pressing, it's really common to feel like a little bit of quick clicking or just my, my shoulders not staying packed and down. And when you do that exercise to prime and warm up, it really wakes up the, the the shoulder and all the stabilizers in the shoulder. So then when I go in to do like a heavy loaded bench, I feel very locked in and secure. Whereas if I don't prime that really well, then I don't I don't feel that. So I like it personally. Now someone may ask, well, why the walking? Why the farmer walk? Why not just hold it in mm. place? You can just hold it in place. You don't mm -hmm. have to walk. But walking adds an element of instability because you're moving. You have to stabilize Weight a little shifts more. on you, yeah. Yeah, so I would say like uh, a regression would be just to hold over your head and stand there. Mm -hmm. And then to make it a little bit more advanced and challenging would be to walk with an overhead uh, hold. So I prefer the walking personally. Yeah. yeah, and also too, it really like emphasizes your, your core stability and control with your lower back. Because like what we're doing is 
um, uh, that that's a weak point. It's a massive weak point for anybody that's doing an overhead press. And so this is a way to address that um, in, in a more challenging uh, environment. Another reason why I love it as a primer is doing it first, because you also have to stabilize in your, your spine and draw on your core. And is that's such a huge element to being good at bench pressing and overhead pressing is getting that all to work synergistically is to be able to brace your core like that, pack your shoulder in that position and then press uh, that primes that really well mm -hmm. by doing that. So it sets you up to, to bench and overhead press really well. Next question is from halo Two. made him nauseous. What's the value of smelling salts? Are they dangerous? You guys don't have a ton of experience with them, right? <laughs> Just a little bit. Can Just I comment on this name? You know that actually happened to me? I think it was Halo 2. Did I talk about that on the podcast? Is that oh, a, yeah. That's when you is that like a playing, jab right? at me right there? I don't even know. Yeah. So I stopped playing video games around Halo 2 because it made me, it made me nauseous. It made me dizzy. And so I no longer. Oh wow! I wonder if he's fucking with me. I don't know. Too I, jumpy. And... I can't remember if I brought that up on the show you years. Did, yeah. did I years did. ago? I talked about that because oh, I used to play egg. video <laughs> games all the time. That would be hilarious. <laughs> if that's a nod. That but would be funny. I, yeah, I stopped playing video games because I would get nauseous because I remember of the you one saying player that. That's so weird. Around. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. Uh, so, so you guys have some experience? Well, have you used it before? Well, I lifts? PR'd uh, using the the smelling salts for for bench. Mm -hmm. So it, it was weird because I hadn't done it before and um, I, I was feeling good that day and I, I felt like I I already got like a bit of a PR and my friend was just like, you know, I feel like you have more. I feel like, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like I just totally expended all my energy in this. And so he cracked open one and he was like, I want you to hit it right after this. And so I did, whoa, the powerful it was like the most powerful ammonia like just got the, the hairs on on my arms like stood straight up and it was this weird like it almost felt like when you see in the movies like your pupils just like boop like everything dilated and yeah. ready to go and it, it was like a super focused lift it, uh, and that's really how i could describe so it. i tried to look up studies to I'm, see if there's studies on it and it does to support it it I'm, does it does it does uh, boost one rep max strength of course it's a physiological uh stimuli so it's like a it, it's it sets off your cns a little bit because it, it's very it's a strong hit like you smell it and it not, it's not a drug so it doesn't have like drug like effects but because it's got this kind of irritating effect in the in the nasal passages, it accelerates heart rate and makes someone feel yeah. like they're more aroused, right? You so, amped. Well, it, they used to amped. use them right to to wake people up that were knocked out, right? Or yeah, like, yeah. Like do you, know, just, psh, do so you know that they talk about like them. being very careful to use these? So they used to do this in sports when people get a concussion. Uh, they'd get a concussion. They'd have them do smelling spots. Go out there and play. Oh, my God. It just masks the That's what problem, they said. Yeah. They said it's very dangerous because uh, it could mask the issues. I mean, I, I, I throw in the category of um, squat shoes, belts, No, wraps. it's way less useful than those things. Smelling oh. salts? Well, oh, you, you, you don't want to use it all the time. Yeah, well, that's I my can't point. imagine it being good. It's, it's like way down the well, that's, your brain. Well, that's my point. My, I throw it in the category of tools like that that I definitely feel a, I've hit PRs using smelling salts. Um, but I, I don't want to get in the habit of having to use a smelling salt every time I go to lift heavy in the gym. Same as I don't want to get in the habit of having to use a belt or use a strap every single time I lift heavy in the gym. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a fun tool to play with, to get a little more out of a lift every once in a while, but something that you do not want to find, like that's part of my routine. Yeah. Every time I, I wouldn't squat, program it, I would just yeah use it for fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I wouldn't. Uh, so, and that's what I mean by putting, it doesn't mean that I mean that salts will get you more than a belt. Who the hell uses smelling salts every time they work out? Well, dude, there's guys that do power that. Power lifters are Well, even those, power but... lifters, you know why they, they shouldn't use it every time you want to, you want to save its efficacy for yeah your max for the lifts. Meat. I use smelling salt, so I use it the most. I've seen guys use it every time for their top end set. Every workout? Yes. Every end on their yeah. top end set. It's in their bag, and when they get to the top end, it's that last set. I use all smelling all salts probably at the most once a month, at the absolute most. We should do it one time before podcast. <laughs> it doesn't last very long. <laughs> yeah. So you know what I used to do at work? So the very first time I discovered smelling salts, I was, I don't know, I was a 20-year-old general manager, and we had it in our first aid kit. And I'm like, oh, I've never used these before. And I cracked one. And I'm like, holy shit. So what I used to do <laughs> is I'd sneak up behind 
sales, my sales people or my trainers. Uh-huh. I crack it and then I put it in front of their nose. <laughs> no, you did yeah. Oh, you dick. And I, ah! That's a dick. Don't so, dude, it's so powerful. Even yeah. if you're like somewhat close proximity, how do you, how far you think it, it travels? Oh, you get a good. It's like at least I've five had people to do that to me, or yeah, something, quite right? a ways. And I'm have like, you, whoa. Now, have you guys tried the like power lifter grade? Because the ones we use are the ones like the Juju you know, Mufu makes one, I guess. The it's nose insane. torque or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I've tried both. Oh, yeah, bro. It's, they're gnarly. Oh, yeah. Your eyes there's are water. ones where so I could crack it here and you will feel it. Knock me on my ass. Yeah, yeah. And then there's other ones where you have to kind of get a little bit closer just to even get a hit from yeah, it. Yeah, but, but it's not, it's, it's, I mean, I guess you could play with them. Have it's a cool toy, them, but Again, it's not I, a workout I, I, tool. I mean, yeah. you're not okay with that that analogy that I'm giving as far as putting in the category that. of. <laughs> I would put it so far down. I can't. I can I can't think of anything. Not. That's- not you're, so you're 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 understanding this incorrectly. This is not me comparing which ones give you the big yeah. biggest results. Yeah. It's how I would utilize it's in your fun it. Bag. Right. 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 Yeah. It's in my bag of stuff. Like, do am I am I anti belt? No, I got a belt. Am I, I have a strap. I have used those things, but it's like. I also don't want to get in the habit of using that on a regular basis, I, but having them in there every once in a while to go rip out an extra yeah. 50 pounds than I would have. Like, Chalk's going to cool. be more useful yeah. for sure. But you're that, and, get... and also okay to use every time. Hey, yeah. hold on real that's quick. That's you different. said an extra 50 pounds. You're not going to get an extra 50 pounds of smelling salts. It's not going to make you lift 50 no, more pounds. I'm, I'm, I'm saying in the category yeah, of all yeah, those yeah, things, yeah. the belt, the belt. I just was. want to say that because I know well, someone's listening. Think, yeah, what do you think it, it would produce oh maybe 10 uh, maybe no not even I, I think i could get like a couple percent maybe more out of my well, body a couple percent on 500 one percent on your very top lift yeah right. like five pounds maybe maybe i mean i can psych myself up to well, what's, what's three percent of 500 yeah. pounds no one percent math guy over here okay. yeah. you know what i'm saying it's like, it's like you're throwing out pounds. numbers maybe that are five. just countering yes. what's your point it's like that's exactly what i think yeah, you get five, i think you get 10 15 five, pounds ten, yeah. yeah i don't know on a squat i'm a gonna tell you right now anybody watching or listening Bench to this sure, they're ten. gonna be disappointed they're gonna use it and they're gonna go lift and they're gonna be like well it wasn't 10 pounds more than it, it, it's it's well okay here's the thing it's yeah. not it's not gonna counter shitty night of rest bad lo- but no. if you're if you're fed and you're 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 prime for a good workout, and then you throw that on there. You might you're gonna hit a PR. I, I mean, I've hit a PR. I I hit PRs on it. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it, it's it, it's still a rep, my best did left my best squat. I hit smelling salts, so it helped for sure. But I also had a belt and other things too. So yeah. I mean, yeah. I, it's it's I mean we're, we're splitting hairs arguing over how many pounds it's gonna get. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to find yeah. a specific study to see. You know what the performance increase was? It was enough to for them to say it, it has some effect, but there's mm-hmm. still a debate as to whether or not it's. Placebo. You know what? I, w- I mean, you know what's one well, that I'm I sure I haven't really a really formally it. tested that now that we have this cold plunge. I tell you what, I I, oh, I bet that's way. More I had some of my best workouts when we were messing it's with the cryotherapy, the effect, yeah. and then I go in and then I go into a lift, and the way I feel when I get out of that that cold plunge, boy, I tell you what, it's it's better than any 400, 400 milligram uh, caffeine pre workout I've ever taken. It's yeah. that it feels that good, and you, the way your body feels from it, the whole body, not just like you being amped up energy wise. So it'd be interesting to test that to see what you can get out from yeah. it. Next question is from Ionic Senior. What is the best midnight snack if you absolutely can't help yourself? Midnight snack. The best. So, so this question's tough for me because what do you mean you can't help yourself? And why are you waking up in the middle of the night? Eat some beef sticks. Man. Hungry. That's, that's what I do. It, well, that, what that tells me, if you're waking up in the middle of the night starving or hungry to the point where you can't help yourself. You didn't eat you're, enough. Yeah, you're not eating enough the day of. Well, I'm, okay, I have a lot of thoughts around this. So first of all, if it fits in your 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 calories and macros and, and it's okay, then then eat it. If it doesn't and that's going to put you over, well then welcome to dieting. That's you're hungry. That's part. Have I think you guys it, ever woke up in the middle of the night so hungry? Maybe yeah, when you were yeah. competing. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. I used to wake when I was up and eat like yeah, two can... two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in the middle of the night and do crazy stuff. like Really? That. Yeah, yeah. I've absolutely. never done that. Wow. But I mean, I was a monster though. You know what I'm saying? I was freaking two hundred thirty something pounds and I two hundred something pounds of lean mass on me. I was eating five thousand calories. So two hundred peanut butter two peanut butter jelly sandwiches for me is like some you know little one hundred fifteen pound girl out taking a bite of beef jerky. It's yeah. like the same thing, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, if it fits in the in your your macros for your goal, then whether you eat it at midnight or eat it at nine p.m. or six p.m. really doesn't matter. Now, if the snack would put you over your calories and your goal is weight loss, well, again, like I say, welcome to 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 dieting. I mean, that's it's this idea that we have around 
Uh, like I can never feel hungry. Yes, that mm-hmm. I, I, like can I eat in a way that I never feel hungry and get the body I want, get super lean and stuff like that? Like, no, if you are going to restrict the body of calories in a in a you're place, supposed to feel hungry. Yes, and you've been and you've been someone who has been overeating for an extended period of your life, whether that be weeks, months, years of your life, and now you're going to start to try and live in a caloric deficit. One of the things is learning to become more comfortable in that state, and it's like you're not going to die. You're, you're not going to starve overnight. You're, you're not going to lose all kinds of muscle, but learning to become comfortable with that. Many times, a glass of water will fix it. Yeah, so what you're yeah. talking about is your relationship with the feeling of being hungry mm-hmm. because you can feel hungry or you can have the signals of hunger, and then it's your relationship to it. And I noticed just through training people that there's some people that have such a poor relationship with the feeling of hunger that they, they say this, I couldn't help myself. Mm-hmm. They're so impulsive around it. So that's a... That's an issue you need to work through yourself. But by the way, there's there's you know some. What I detri- used to tell clients, you know, I used to tell clients, and I know there's a bunch of science nerds that are gonna get all butthurt about this, but I don't give a shit. Help my clients out. I used to tell I used to tell my clients that is our body switching over and metabolizing fat when you feel that. So when you feel well, you're helping that, them get that like accept the feeling. That's yeah. well that 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 was really what you're, I was I was playing the psychology it differently. In I was. Mind. I was like, so man, when you get that feeling. I mean, you could go jump up and go feed it, but now your body's now going to use that sugar as fuel. Yeah, yeah. And so you're no longer reaping the benefits. But when you're laying in bed and you have that hunger feeling, that's you're feeling what's happening right now. Your body's shifting over to metabolizing fat to get you through the night. Yeah. So yeah, you can get well, up and go have a nice healthy snack, but now it's going to utilize that healthy snack instead of use, utilizing the extra body fat. I guess the other angle I just I kind of want to address with this question is is in terms of like your quality of sleep. That, like, you hit the nail on the head. So what, what are we doing in... In, in a sense of like, what am I accomplishing by now feeding myself, which then interrupts my sleep, which then all the recovery and all the benefits happen if you, you know, maximize your, your sleep. So I would, that, that would be my concern in terms of it waking me up versus me then having to address that earlier to make sure that I'm Look, preparing myself You better. hit the nail on the head. It's not just calories and macros. Eating in between sleep has other far reaching effects that are negative. Like your, your digestive system also has a circadian rhythm. So yeah, but you also you have, could wake up and have bright light. There's also that tells your brain the sun. There's is also up. different scenarios on how you're going to, how we're going to approach this. Okay. I'm how I'm coaching right now. My sister-in-law and I'm, I'm looking at her nutrition last night. She grossly under eats protein every single day. And she only eats like 1100 calories. If she told me this was her calling in and she's like, Hey, it's in the middle of the night and I'm, I'm getting, I'm hungry. And I see she's eating a thousand calories a day. She's hitting 70 to 80 grams of protein every day. I'm going to tell her I'd rather, I want her to eat because she's grossly under consuming. Yeah. But are you going to say something like, okay, now moving forward, let's have you eat more during the day. Well, of course, of course. Right. Because here's what happens. Yeah. You eat in the middle of the night. Now what you've done is you've disrupted your the the beneficial recovery hormones your circadian rhythm now says we need to be awake because your your digestive system also influences your circadian rhythm you've got worse sleep then ghrelin is higher the di- the day after meaning cravings are even higher because you had poor sleep so although you might have satisfied your appetite in the middle of the night you've actually made it harder for yourself the day after this is like a lose 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 uh, situation mm. really what you need to do if this is you is you need to figure out what the hell is happening during the day to make it so that you wake up in the night so damn hungry and fix that because this is not a good I agree solution. 100% yeah. agree with that yeah. I, I think you 100% this is not a like oh just there's a there's a snack that we're all going to say oh this is a great midnight snack that you should eat it's like you should address your potential you know, deficit or your lack of nutrients that you might not be getting and you should be having an earlier day. If you're getting your, your, right. what you need and you're just hungry because you're low calorie because you're dieting and it's not uh, abnormally low, right? It's not like my, my sister-in-law who's eating a thousand calories. If you're at 2,400 calories and that's a deficit for you and you're losing body fat and you wake up hungry, well, welcome to the club. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what happens. I mean, you get, you get hungry when you're low calorie and you're used to feeding the body 3,500 all the time. Next question is from Sandy Toes seven. I'm doing MAPS Anabolic now. Please explain why rest between sets is important. After doing boot camp style workouts where rest periods are somewhat active between oh circuits, God. I'm not sure what rest truly means. Oh do I God. sit and do nothing or move around a bit? What's the goal? This is a, this is a new listener for sure. <laughs> this is common. This is a common question. Yeah. So I'm going to say something that might sound controversial, but it actually is very true. What makes strength training strength training or what makes resistance training resistance training is not the weights. It's not that you're lifting something heavy. It's the rest periods. Yeah. The rest periods is it's what makes it strength training. So though. much that I'm going to go out and tell this person that was running this boot camp, you know what you all you were really doing? 
was cardio. Cardio with weights. It's just a bunch of cardio with different pieces of equipment. You were not resting, and you were doing act what they would call active resting, where your boot camp instructor had you doing jumping jacks before you got ready for your next circuit of weights that you're going to do, and then you did ropes, and then you and that's how you did. You were doing cardio. Yep. That's all you're doing. You're getting mostly the benefits from cardio. Very, very minimal to no benefit for lifting weights. You may as well just done jumping jacks or whip the rope around. That's for that right. Entire and, hour. I, and I'll say this: the vast majority of these that I see, they you can insert whatever exercise you want in their circuit. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They use a bunch of different things to make you feel like you're doing a bunch of cool it's stuff. It's 100% the only real benefits you are getting from those is the, the calorie burn and, and, the, the, stamina, and the stamina and the stamina building. That's it. That is it. That's, That's all it. you're getting from so, training that So way. here's why you rest, right? So there's different types of energies that you use while you exercise. The first type of energy is what's called ATP. So ATP is... It burns hot, but it burns very quickly. So that's what you get when you do explosive movements, like a sprint, or you do things like strength training. Yeah. Once that's Fast burned twitch. up, then you move on to glycogen, which is this, it doesn't burn as hot. It doesn't burn as fast. It lasts a long time. And that's the kind of muscle energy you get when you do like long distance running, or when I'm doing like a hundred reps of squats or a hundred reps of curls, or I'm doing circuit training. The energy system that you target is what gets your body to adapt in a particular way. If I train my ADP, ATP system, I'm going to build muscle. If I train for glycogen, to burn lots of glycogen uh, and stamina, I'm not going to build lots of muscle and strength. I'll just get lots of stamina. So if you're not resting in between sets, you're not doing strength training. Even though you feel like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm just sitting here. That's what makes it strength training. That's what makes it build muscle. That's what makes it speed up your metabolism. The question was, what do I do with the rest periods? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you do nothing. Yeah. You sit there. If you, you really have to do something, read, but don't do anything physical because what you want is you want to replenish the very hot burning but fast burning ATP stores, yeah. which takes about 60 seconds up to maybe so, three minutes yeah, or four minutes. Seconds, yeah. yeah. Let it replenish and then go train it again and build strength and build muscle. Otherwise, you're not doing strength training. And it's true, right? It's it's the rest periods that makes the strength training. It's not even the exercises. Yeah, it's just so funny because this is a very, very difficult one to to pound in that kind of a person's head uh, because it is, it doesn't, it feels like, well, the the workout's worthless now, you know, because I'm just <laughs> yeah. sitting here. And, and, and then shifting the mindset of also being able to um, really try to ramp up uh, so they address their their weightlifting and, and actually push themselves to full exertion yep. in their weight training is a completely different mindset yep. uh, instead of just moving weights and moving, moving, moving and feeling busy. Yeah. Uh, so this is definitely a challenging one, but it's just funny because we haven't had uh, that type of a question in a while. And it's, By the way, this, this is I, could still very I could picture this common. woman. I yeah. could picture, I had so many clients like her. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess, Sandy, that first off that you're a woman and that you're probably late thirties, mid forties. Uh, your kids are old enough now. So now you're going to the gym and you are super busy, do everything all the time. And you like to sweat a lot and get real sore in your workout. Yeah. And you That's love, a and you very love, typical you love class client. settings. You, you love know, class. This, settings. this is mm -hmm. the, the group, the group training, like, right? yeah. uh, and, and then you can't, and you can't figure out why your results suck so bad. Like why you have to try so hard and why you have to eat so little and why it just doesn't seem like your body wants to respond. This is why. If you want your body to respond, do what we say, which is build strength, build muscle, boost your metabolism. The workouts are going to feel totally different. It doesn't feel like a cardio workout. You're not going to be sweating yeah. and out of breath, but you will get muscular fatigue. You will notice that your muscles will start to shape and build. Well, and she's lift. running Don't maps afraid, anabolic now. Yes. Yeah, so Don't be afraid of inc increasing load. Get strong. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the thing the you focus. want to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.